Africa is the world's second largest and second most populous continent. It is home to about 1.1 billion people. There are differing views about Africa across the world. Some people think that Africa is home to savages, people who wear no shoes and have no form of education. Some others think that Africa is one country and you hear them say things like, are you from Africa? When are you going back to Africa? But Africa is a beautiful continent. It has vast arable land. It is filled with talented and entrepreneurial people. It has vast business opportunities across various sectors and industries. And this is the Africa we are here to show you. My name is Deborah Ladeko and I'm the president of the Lagos Business School Africa Business Conference 2016. This year, we are rolling out a campaign tagged The Africa We See. The Africa We See is aimed at rebranding Africa. Join me as I speak with various people about doing business in Africa as well as generating insights across different areas in Africa, political opportunities, business opportunities and various opportunities as it were. In Africa we've been since uh, close to the World War I, 1928. Um, we came into Africa through South Africa. South Africa was the first, was the first country that we operated in in 1928. And um, ever since then we've grown. We've, uh, we had the first plant also in South Africa in 1940. And in Nigeria specifically, we came in in 1951 and we started operation. Generally, we view Africa the same way we view opportunities anywhere globally. We see opportunities in terms of the population, the demographics that you see in Africa. Africa has got some of the fastest growing countries and have had some of the fastest growing countries until most recently. The top seven growing countries last year uh, were in Africa as a continent. So we, we see beyond that, we look at playing locally and we look at long-term operation. That's why we can be here for 90 years and I can almost assure you that we'll be here for another 90 years. IHS is the largest tower company in Africa, Europe and the Middle East. We are also the ninth largest in the world. It's a company that started in Nigeria 15 years ago, but it now operates in five African countries. Uh, so, and we have ambition to move to one, two, three, even more countries in the next uh, few years. So that is where uh, IHS is. Why Africa? We moved as, as founding uh, partners. We moved to, to Nigeria, Lagos in particular, in late 90s. I was in my 20s. Uh, this became home. And then we moved through the, the, the growth phase of the transformation of the continent, including uh, Nigeria. In 2000, basically, Nigeria had 400,000 working telephone lines with 150 million people. I mean, imagine where we were then. Uh, uh, that massive growth, we've moved from there to almost 120, 130 million telephone lines at the moment in Nigeria alone. That massive growth is basically what fueled our uh, uh, progression. Google has been in Nigeria for about five years now. Okay. Actually, that's the length of time we've been at Sub-Saharan Africa as well. And we came in early, observing the trends around Nigerians getting online and um, getting more uh, engagement online. We found that there was a growing trend, even though at the time um, it was still a very small percentage of the population, but there was a constant year-on-year -year increase. And so we thought, let's come in and be part of building the online ecosystem. And so our strategy has been focused on three things. The first is access. How do we make the internet more accessible and affordable to the Nigerian user, right? And um, as part of this, we, we have a program with universities where we provide internet access for free over a period of time, provide free software, and just help the faculty and student community to get online. Uh, the second strategic pillar is content, relevance. Because one thing is to get access, but how do you make sure that when people get online, they can engage, they have locally relevant content. And so we've been working with different partners to make sure that we get Nigerian creative content, business information, maps online. And then the third piece is sustainability, which is really about capacity development. We've been training developers, entrepreneurs to be able to develop great apps that people can engage with and to ensure that there are skills in the marketplace that can really help fuel this ecosystem that we're helping to build. My name is Obehim Sifugbe, but a full-time MBA 13 student with the Lagos Business School. The Africa I see is the next market hub.
Hello, my name is Adi Bimpe Dikpe, a full-time MBA candidate at Lagos Business School. Africa is going to create value using agriculture. Africa is going to feed the world come 2050. This is the Africa I see. So taking from what you said about the growing population in Africa, um, I was wondering, could you uh, shed more light on how this uh, demography change, like you mentioned, is affecting the telecoms industry across Africa? I think it's, it's, it's affecting it massively. I mean, th there are so many aspects to this. F the first aspect is, of course, the numbers. The numbers by themselves present a massive opportunity. So when you talk a billion people, when you talk 60% of them or 70% have phone lines, voice phone lines, it means 700 million. It, it, it means there are another 300 million people who don't have phone lines. It means a businessman needs to look at if this continent is growing by another billion in the next 30, 40 years, there's massive room for, 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 for further growth. Besides that, you need to also look at the type of uh, telephony that these, uh, uh, the people have. In Africa, we have voice, which is 67% penetration. We have basic 3G, which started a few years ago. Maybe 20%, 15 to 20% of the users have a 3G service. But if you look at where the world is, everybody's moved to broadbandings, proper broadbandings. Nobody uses basic phones anymore. Everyone has a smartphone. Every, nobody wants to, to talk. People want to transact through applications. Uh, this younger generation, I mean, if you see them even as they're dating, they're sitting across the table, they're not even talking, they're talking through an application. So the world has changed. And, and Africa still lags behind when it comes to this. We need to enable the African population so that in a way every single person has a broadband telephone, a smartphone with a good broadband uh, connection. So imagine the opportunity to create that infrastructure. Massive. Interesting. So based on what you said, well, I was, I was also thinking there are quite a number of challenges knowing that you run an infrastructure company and Africa being generally known as an infrastructure deficient continent. How has IHS been able to scale over the orders of infrastructural challenges in Africa? Yes. So as you rightfully said, there are many challenges here, infrastructural challenges. The, the security is a challenge, of course. Lack of electricity is a big challenge, uh, transportation, logistics, uh, the, 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 the lack of existing, of, of, of uh, the non-existence of a proper land ownership uh, registry system, for example. I mean, try to own something in Lagos, for example. You, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's a very complex process. Try to transfer ownership. So the whole, the whole infrastructure, of course, is, is lagging by. But for us, while, while people see this as, as, as a challenge, it is a challenge, it's also an opportunity. I mean, you can sit, sit back and say, gosh, it's, it's too much to do, so I'm just going to stay in Germany or in England and, and enjoy London. But, but, or you can do something about it. What we have done basically in a way, we have found solutions to this problem as it affects us. So we have 14,000 towers in Nigeria. Imagine 14,000 locations all over. Each of these locations require electricity. So imagine the size of our problem with lack of electricity. So we came up with a solution. We came up with solar. Solar systems work. We designed the right system. Whenever we build a, uh, a tower, we make sure there is a solar system. So yes, we don't have grid. We don't want to use diesel that much. We use a combination that relies on solar. So we found a solution. When it comes to security, I have to admit, yes, there are some regions where we have security issues. But through years of local integration, working with the local uh, 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 region. So I, am, I, am, I may be not the best person to handle uh, the community in Borno State. But my engineer, who's been with me for the past 10 years, whom I've helped to create a company, I've, I've encouraged him to spin from IHS, create his own business, use that business to supply us for concrete, then rig, then maybe buy a few trucks, then bring his wife and his cousin, and now he has a business in that state, which makes millions a year, guaranteed uh, from me. We became so integrally connected into that economically and in other ways with, with the region. In a way, you solve your security problem. So you, you don't have security issues anymore because the local community is, 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 is benefiting as if it's a partner in your uh, business. So you find solutions and you move on. And once you find solution, remember, we're talking about massive, massive growth, growth that is inexistent anywhere else in, on, on Earth today. Europe is shrinking. 
uh, USA is barely flat, Asia is moving but now it's slowing down. So Africa is, is the growth numbers are, are uh, magnificent. My name is Adetola Adebite. The Africa I see is a place where the opportunities for economic growth and development can be fully and completely unearthed to result in better quality of life for everyone. How does Google measure success in terms of each one, the access, the contents, the sustainability? What's the measure of success for each of them? It's a really good question. So if I start with access, one of the tangible programs we have is the university access program that I talked about where we provide it, uh, internet bandwidth to universities. Now, uh, a measure of success would be usage, right? Because it's one thing for the infrastructure to be there, but yeah. you want it, you want people to be to engage with it, you want it to actually impact the way people learn yeah. and the way people share information on a daily basis. And so our measure of success is usage, right? We monitor the level of usage um, on those platforms. Um, and in, in some cases, we found that capacity utilization went from zero to 100 percent wow, within a few days of going live, which shows that there is a lot of latent demand sure. in Nigeria, right? People are just limited by infrastructure. And if we can fix the problems around infrastructure, we'll see a huge uh, growth uh, across multiple sectors. So that's one example. Uh, another example would be um, in terms of uh, getting businesses online, a measure of success there would be the number of businesses that did get online mm -hmm. and also the level of engagement, right? Um, the lo level of interaction and engagement for those digital assets that were created. Um, with maps, for example, you know, we've been doing a lot of work getting Nigerian maps online and okay. updating those on a, uh, a regular basis. And we do measure the quality of the mapping information. So we have uh, uh, indices that uh, tell us, uh, that give us a, a sense of the quality of our mapping information. So those are examples. And the number of developers trained, those kinds of things. We all know that in Africa and in Nigeria as well, the countries across Africa are a little deficient in infrastructure and in, um, technological infrastructure. So how does Google manage with the infrastructure on ground? Does it set up its own infrastructure wherever it decides to um, pitch its tent or it works with the government's infrastructure as it is or there is some form of collaboration with the government in terms of building infrastructure to be used? We work very closely with local partners and stakeholders and government. So um, in, in some countries where we've uh, identified um, an opportunity to actually be more closely involved in providing infrastructure, we have actually taken that step. So for example, in Uganda, we launched Project Link. We championed the lane of fiber, right, oh. that the ISPs could then ride on. Uh, we have a similar project that has just gone live in Accra, in Ghana. Um, in Nigeria, we've been um, working closely with uh, the telecom operators, with governments. We were part of the committee that uh, developed the Nigerian broadband plan. Okay. Just looking at what, what are the different bottlenecks to broadband growth and what are the things that need to happen from a policy perspective, from a training perspective, from an incentives perspective, etc., to remove those bottlenecks. Uh, we, and we've been a huge part of that, as well as um, providing infrastructure to universities and those kinds of programs. So we like to work with the ecosystem. So we, um, on a case-by-case -case basis, work with different partners and look at what would make the difference in this environment. My name is Jadis Salasuraka, full-time MBA student at the Lagos Business School. Come 2030, all individuals in Africa will have access to basic healthcare. This is the Africa I see. Next 20 to 30 years, what trends do you see happening in Africa, in Nigeria, in Africa, that um, you think will be worth taking note of? That's a broad question, um, but the first one uh, that I personally um, I'm never, I never cease to be amazed about how that changes life is one of technology. Uh, we have the opportunity in Africa to use technology to leapfrog uh, or, or to, to advance much more rapidly. You have a variety of things that you can do over the internet. You can order, you can order a Coke with a personalized name off the internet these days. Uh, but imagine if you wanted to do that 10 years ago or five years ago. So just think forward, 10 years, 20 years, what, if we can do that off the palm of our hands with a cell phone, what is it going to be 
10 years, 20 years from, from today. So that's one aspect that I, I see as a trend that is going to improve or it's going to affect, it's going to affect doing business on the continent significantly. My name is Adi Doin Yogovode. The Africa IC is the hope of the world. With over 40% of our population under the age of 20, I believe there's no better time to be in this great continent than now. Setting the pace, setting the trend for future generations to come. This is the Africa IC. Also talking in line with the government policies. So for example, in Nigeria, I'm thinking of easy accessibility of our internet service to regular Nigerians or regular Africans using Nigeria as a proxy. So for example, I want to buy uh, a data bundle and I have to buy a data bundle, maybe three gig for about 5,000 Naira or 4,000 Naira. So in terms of, maybe not the government as an entirety, but the uh, entity or a governing body that governs um, communications and all, what do you think that they could do to help to make internet and data affordable for young Africans or young Nigerians as the case may be? That's what I was talking about at the beginning of my conversation. Today, we have a lot of voice connections, but the world is moving to data, as you rightfully said. And the move to data means infrastructure needs to be upgraded. So all these towers we have, they need to have equipment, the, the operators, the carriers, like the MTN, Airtel, and, and it is a lot of this work, they need to install equipment and switches, you know, to cater for the new technology which is the fourth generation technology. This is the fast internet technology. This costs billions of dollars, so that's one. So, so you need to, to find a solution, the funding needs to happen. Second of all, you need, once most of these towers are connected with microwave links and things like that, for us to move to the fourth generation, we need to connect them with fiber. That is also billions of dollars probably. But this is what the private sector needs to do. The private sector in Nigeria and in Africa in general, I have seen it, they can find solutions. And we are a proof of that, right? And we can help substantially with that because this is what we do. We build infrastructure. We've raised 2.8 billion only last uh, year. We can do it again. Uh, that's what we do. So, so that I think we can resolve. The, the government needs to enable that environment, in my opinion, by issuing frequency spectrum. That's the third leg of the equation. So you need infrastructure, you need the fiber to connect, and then you need frequency spectrum. Most of the fourth generation frequency spectrum is licensed frequency spectrum that the government still holds. Some of it, it's not with them, they still need to free it up from others, but that frequency spectrum needs to be offered to the carriers all over Africa for them to start rolling out. My name is uh, Dr. Nubi Achebo, and this is the Africa that I see. I see an Africa that's uh, rising and developing very rapidly in the next uh, decade or so. For our foreign friends, I would say Africa has great prospects, great market, great people. If they want to come in, they should because our experience has taught us we can make a lot of money and then benefit people at the same time by, 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 by developing infrastructure. They have to think long term, however. They have to think long term and they have to invest in the development of people. People are your biggest assets uh, in Africa, by far. And if they are, if, if they are respectful to, to the heritage and to, to the pride of Africans, I think they can do amazing uh, things. All right, thank you so much, Isha. Thank you. We really appreciate your time.